Hello, my name is Anne van Grinsven and I will give a talk on a decalogue for SWOT or SWOT Plus with the aim to go towards good modeling practices for SWOT or SWOT Plus model applications. My presentation will start with a talk about the problem of reproducibility of hydrological modeling studies and then I will move to the decalogue for SWOT. Reproducibility relies on the ability of scientists to produce each other's published results so that they can build on, upon prior knowledge. Recently, reproducibility of science has come under scrutiny as it has been discovered that a large portion of scientific research is not reproducible. Begley, for instance, reported in a study within the field of medicine that only 11% of the research results could be reproduced. Baker reported that in more than 70% of the studies that it was not possible to reproduce each other published results. And this involved researchers from biology, chemistry, earth and environmental sciences, medicine, physics and engineering. A lack of transparency is mainly due to incomplete scientific reporting. For instance, the authors do not describe the tool with enough details. Or they are not providing the codes, or they are not providing the sources of the data, or details on how, on how they have been applying these tools. There are reasons for that, as often many details are needed, which may hamper the flow of the story. In only a few cases, there is a bad intention, such as fraud. In this presentation, we present a decalogue of SWOT with the aim to solve the problem of reproducibility. With Decalogue, it is referred to the Ten Commandments for Good Life that God sent to Moses. The first commandment is that the context should be well understood and well described. This consists of listing the data, give an overview of the existing knowledge and clearly describe the purpose of the model. All the data should be described as well as the metadata um, and also the missing data should be mentioned. Sometimes pre-processing is recommended, for instance, to calculate areas, uh, aerial rainfall in sub-basins. It is important to know if all basic data are available for SWOT applications. There should be a good overview of SWOT applications in the case study of the region. It is important to reflect whether SWOT is a good tool for the purpose of the study. So to summarize, it is important that you should that we, you should report on all the sources of the data, that you should include a literature review, and that you also justify the choice of SWOT. The second commandment uh, deals with, with the fact that you should more closely look at this data and evaluate it. So uh, are there missing data? Are the mountains and orographic effects well represented? Is there any pre-processing needed? Do we need a bias correction? Uh, because a biased rainfall will lead to imbalanced hydrological mass balances and errors in all fluxes. In this example, reanalysis data was used for catchment in Rwanda. We see that the annual values are strongly biased and are not cor correlated to the observed annual rainfall values. At the other hand, the monthly seasonalities are correlated. So, a bias correction could lead to some useful rainfall data. So, it's important to check the data and double check. Make sure that uh, the units are okay and perform, perhaps also perform a mass balance analysis. Are there no bias corrections? Is pre-processing needed? Uh, this is all to be considered before moving to modeling. Besides the rainfall, it's also important to evaluate the GIS data. For instance, the topography map, DM. DM is used to delineate the catchment, but also it calculates the slopes. In this example, a resolution of one kilometer on the left is compared with 90 meter on the right. The one kilometer is not able to find all the connections of the rivers and results in a smaller catchment. But also, the average hill slope is lower than when you use a low resolution topography map, which results in lower water yields, 
and a very strong estimation, underestimation of the erosion. Hence, the following advices should be followed. The quality of the data depends on the case, very importantly on the scale. It is also very important to report quality checks, missing data and pre-processing activities. A third comment is to understand and justify the model assumptions. Also SWOT is built on many assumptions. Some of them are listed below, for instance, the water flows downstream, groundwater flows in the same direction as the surface water flow, and it also has a relatively simple routing. No tidal influences, no complex networks, no backwater effects. Many processes and parameters are based on US conditions. Also the Plancroft module using the heat units is more suited for the Northern Hemisphere. Some of these assumptions can be overcome by the SWAT plus model version as it offers more flexibility, but it still needs the information and this information has to be brought in the model. For example, in the SWAT plus we can divert the groundwater to other catchments. The SWAT model uses the curve number, which responds to soil properties, land use and slopes. So, most surface water is typically generated in the headwaters where the slopes are high. But, and this is the case for the left figure. But, at Cornell University they developed a water balance method. Um, in this method, water is generated when the soil is saturated. Infiltration is then hampered, resulting in surface runoff. Since the soils are typically shallow near the river, there is less storage available. As a result, most surface water will be generated in the valleys. Both approaches are happening in reality. And often the truth might be in the middle. Both processes more might occur. In general terms, it is important that you justify the choice, of the choice of the SWOT plus model. In a modeling report, it is important to mention the version of SWOT and the release number. Models are and can be very useful tools, but they are only a, a, an, ap an approximation of the reality. That means that you should never adjust the reality to the model. If the model is not suited for your case to do, you should not use it. For instance, if SWOT does not represent certain elements which are important for your case study, for instance, you want to model an area with large, where large polders exist, for instance, in the Netherlands, then maybe SWOT is not the best choice. This brings us to the fourth comment. It is related on how you set up your SWOT model and how you report on this setup. There are many decisions that a user has to do when setting up a model. This is needed to define your sub-basins as well as the landscape units, uh, as well as the HRUs. There is no general rule on how to do this. It's based on expertise and judgment of the modeler. Whatever the modeler decides, ideally, this should be justified. In any case, the choices and decisions need to be reported, including the definition of land use, HRU, and landscape units. If lakes and reservoirs were implemented, it should also be reported. You should also report which evapotranspiration method and which routing method you selected. Otherwise, your work is not reproducible. Okay, after setting up your model, the next step is the calibration of the process parameters, parameters, which is often a challenge for SWOT, as SWOT contains many parameters. Uh, there are many, the process of calibration is complicated and involves changing your parameters in such a way that you better match your results. For instance, if your fit is not very good, then you choose other parameters and you hope to obtain a better fit. That's the principle of calibration. This is especially needed when using SWOT outside of the U US. Through the calibration, you adjust your parameter values according to lo local conditions. 
It is important when you set up your calibration that you have a methodology or a strategy. It can involve menu as well as automatic techniques or a combination. Before starting the calibration, it is very important that you first check the model for potential errors. Calibrations can and should not fix errors or, or certain problems in the model setup or potentially human errors. Don't use too many parameters in your calibration. Only the ones that are important or uncertain. You can use a sensitivity analysis to find out what, which parameters are important. After you have found, you found the parameter values for your parameters, it is also important to check um, whether your parameters have a physical meaning and that you always report the values of your parameters. I will go further on this physical meaning of parameters. This is related to the way you calibrate your parameters. There are three ways in SWOT. Uh, you can do it by replacement by value. This is, for instance, in this case, you may give all the parameters the same value, for instance, for all the HRUs. So there will be one value for the entire catchment. The second is that you add a certain value to initial parameters. For instance, you could add five to all, cur to all curve numbers, and then you get more enough. Or you can use a multipli multiplying factor, which is then multiplied to your initial parameter value. This method is very often used in SWOT because you have many distributed parameters and each HRU, for instance, may have a different initial value. Here we have an example. Here we are going to change the saturated hydraulic conductivity of your HRUs um, more specifically for a case where you have two layers, so, uh, three layers, sorry, and two soil types, soil A and soil B. You can see that soil A has higher values than soil B. That means that the hydraulic conductivity is higher there. You can also see that the top layer has higher values. So there is an initial relationship between the uh, parameters. By multiplying these parameters with a certain factor, factor, you get a new set of parameters. But the relation between the parameters is maintained. After we have set, um, we get given new parameters to the new, new values to the parameters, we can continue to check the physical meaning of the parameters. Parameters do have a physical meaning. They have an absolute value, and they have, but they also have a relative relationship. You should check for this. For instance, curve numbers in grasslands should have a higher value than curve numbers in urbanized areas. Some parameters may need special attention. Here I, li I list a few. For instance, if you apply the groundwater minimum threshold, you're somehow putting a threshold in your model and you will only generate groundwater once you the groundwater storage go above this threshold. Note that you will build a certain storage in your system. Also, groundwater deep is important to consider as it represents the losses in the deep aquifer. If it's very high, it may be unrealistic, especially for large case studies. Next hydraulic conductivity in the channel is also an important parameter. It only happens in areas where the groundwater table is lower than the riverbed. This is not often the case in temperate zones, but it might be a case in arid zones. So we should also check the physical meaning and potentially you can also look at literature. For, as an example, I mentioned the Manning coefficient. There are lots of values available in literature for this Manning coefficient, coefficient. And you could also check your value with these references. Note that the range for the Manning coefficient in SWOT is quite broad. So it's likely that you may end up with an unrealistic value through a calibration. After calibration, it is very important to do an evaluation 
In hydrological modeling, this is typically done with bias and measures of cliff efficiency. The bias is represents how much your model is either underestimating or overestimating. So ideally, it should be zero. The Nezhan Shutcliffe efficiency represents the error. So it compares the mean squared error against the variance. It should be at, as close to one. The advantage of these performance indicators is that they are normalized so that you can compare them. And there is also literature that provides an indication of how good your model is when you end up with a certain value for your p-bias or your Ness and Shutcliffe efficiency. But never rely only on these indicators. For instance, in this figure, we can see an NSE value of 0.65, which would be good according to literature. But if we look at the graph, we see that we miss all the peaks. This is typically happening when you don't have good quality of rainfall data, especially on the timing of the rainfall events. This is very often the case in tropical areas because rainfall is very erratic. It may happen at a certain location, but not at another location. If you then optimize your model for the Nash and Sutcliffe efficiency, you may end up with these results. So we were not happy with the model. Imagine we would use this model for flood protection. In the next slide, we changed the parameters. You should mainly look at the blue and the red line. The blue line refers to the observations and the red line are the simulations. In this model, we generated more high peak values. The green values represent the uncertainty. So, message here is that you always, always, always should perform a qualitative evaluation, including a graph. Once you have done this for the calibration period, it is strongly recommended to also calculate the performance indicators and to make a graph for a validation or a verification period, which is visualized in this graph. So, what do we learn from this validation period? It tells us whether we had some overfitting problem. This may occur when you use too many parameters or not, you didn't use enough data. In that case, you may have a good fit for the calibration, but you may not have a good fit anymore in the validation period. It also checks whether you represented different conditions. It could be that your calibration period only represented dry years. And then if your validation period includes some wet years, you may run, run into problems. It may also indicate a trend. A trend may be a result, for instance, when your warming up period was not long enough or whether there was a change in the system. So important is that a model with a highness and Sutcliffe efficiency is not always a good model. For that reason, you also have to do other checks, perform a qualitative evaluation with a graph and also perform a model verification using a different period, the validation period. After these checks, there should be more things to evaluate. Very important is to check the hydrological mass balance. That brings me to the seventh commandment. In this analysis, we compare the inputs versus the outputs, and they should be in balance. The inputs are everything that goes into the model, which is primarily precipitation. The outputs is what goes out. This is the water yield, which is composed by surface runoff, lateral flow and groundwater flow. But we also have evapotranspiration or deep losses. We may also have capillary rise, which is not going to the soil. It's a loss. Um, there is, of course, also storage, but on a, when we use a long, long simulation period, we can assume that the storage is negligible. 
We can check the hydrological mass balance for the soil layers, but we can also do it for the shallow aquifer separately. There are several tools available to help you in this hydrological mass balance. For instance, we have the currently released James Plus tool for the SWAT Plus applications, or we have SWAT Checker. Commandment 8 asks to reflect on the human interaction in the catchment and how it is represented in the model. It reflects to the management operations, whether it's done automatically or whether you use manual settings. You should be aware that often there are some settings in the model, even if you didn't do anything. These are the default settings. It's important to represent what's happening in the catchment due to human interactions. For instance, reservoir operations, but also very important what is done with the agriculture management. Especially, irrigation might have a big influence on your hydrology. In this slide, we see the SWOT simulations of the leaf area index on the top. Leaf area index represents the vegetation. When there's a lot of vegetation, the leaf area index is high. In the SWOT simulation, we see high vegetation during the months April to June. Below, we have the leaf area index according to remote sensing. In the remote sensing results, we see high vegetation mainly during the months June up to September. So the growing season, according to remote sensing, is later. And we assume that the remote sensing results are right. So we should adjust our SWOT model. And this is important as it influences the evapotranspiration. This we can see in the following slides. During the dry, uh, for, during the dry season, we see that the simulations of evapotranspiration between the original SWOT model and an adapted SWOT model that better covers the observations according to remote sensing are similar. But if we focus on the growing season, then we see that there is a big difference in the evapotranspiration when we don't represent the growing season properly. So, it is very important to identify the human interactions and to judge the importance of these. Should we represent it? Sometimes it's not possible to represent every interaction, but it's important not to miss out when they are important. You can check whether you have a good agricultural representation by looking at the biomass or the crop yields. And it's also very important that you report the settings, also when you are using default settings. The ninth commandment refers to uncertainties. Good modeling practices recommend that you acknowledge these uncertainties. There are many uncertainties in the model. First of all, we use observations to evaluate and calibrate our models. But these observations don't represent correctly the truth. So there's already an error in the observations. There are also errors in the input that we put in the model. And there, rainfall input is the, main, is the most critical input. There are also uncertainties in the parameters that resulted from the calibration. But there are also uncertainties in the model descriptions itself. That results in errors around these simulations, and we should cap capture these errors. We can do, the, do this by performing an uncertainty analysis. The ninth commandment tells you that you should also acknowledge the uncertainties. This is a very important aspect of hydrological modeling studies. First of all, there are errors in the observations. We use these observations for the calibration and the evaluation. There are, from the beginning, errors in these observations. They are not a true value. They are an observed value. So there is already some uncertainty at this level. Next, there are uncertainties in the input data. Especially the rainfall is critical. Also, the parameters are uncertain. We obtain them through calibration, but in this process, there are many potential errors involved 
and assumptions behind the whole processes. There are also uncertainties in the model formulations and potentially also on how we set up the model. All of this makes that we are not fully certain of our simulation and that there is an error. We should represent this by an uncertainty band. We can do this by performing an uncertainty analysis. The last one refers to how you use the model. If you use it to run scenarios, you should be careful not to extrapolate too far. This brings us to a summary. These are the 10 commandments for good modeling practices for SWOT. First of all, consider and describe the full context of the model. Evaluate the inputs of the model. Understand and justify the model assumptions. Choose proper setup op options when you set up the model and report them. Do and report also the model parameterization carefully. Perform a qualitative and a quantitative evaluation on your mo model outputs. So also make a fit. Check the hydrological mass balance, whether in and out is more or less in balance. Check the land use and the management practices and other op operations. Acknowledge the uncertainties and then, once you start to run simulations, do not extrapolate too far. With this, we hope that also the transparency can be maximized, because the modeling work should be reproducible. Someone should be able to get the same results with what you reported. And this is related to, to what you report on inputs, parameter values, model setups, and many other decisions also on the human interaction. Reporting is fundamental. Luckily, when using SWOT, you use an open software, so at least the codes are available for every simulation. If you enjoyed this talk, then you can find more materials at the GLOW Network. Thank you very much.